Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Gym Theater. My name is Arthur White. I'm Director of External Affairs with Detroit Opera, and uh, we are so thrilled to be here. This is the first, even though we're right across the street, uh, we have not really collaborated with the gym, so we are very excited to uh, do this partnership. Hopefully, it will be the first of many. Now, uh, Detroit Opera, for a while, these last few seasons, always does a site-specific opera. Uh, it's, good, it's a chance for you know, different audiences to hear what we do, and sometimes there are works like today's which are so intimate that maybe aren't appropriate for a nearly 3,000-seat 3, 3, house. And so that's why this particular work, I, work works especially well in this space, and you will see. You are in for quite uh, a treat today. So we're here to witness uh, American composer John Cage's Euro 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 Operas 3 and 4, uh, a piece which breaks uh, you know, European traditions and reassembles it in a collage, and so you'll know more about that if you don't already know about this piece. You'll be experts before you uh, before the curtain goes up. Now, with pre-recorded music, live singers, pianists, stage actions determined through chance operations, and a digital clock, which is taking the place of the conductor, uh, Cage's unpredictable, entertaining light and soundscape uh, will challenge your eyes and your ears. I got a chance to see the production uh, last night. So often with these operas, I'm tasked with speaking about them. And so usually I've seen, you know, Bohem or whatever it might be, a thousand and one times. Uh, and so with this piece, I was not familiar with. So I've been talking about it theoretically over the last six months, but I never actually had seen it until last night. And you are, I, I was pretty much blown out of my seat. I didn't quite know what to expect when they would talk about this collage. But um, Cage created this uh, work, uh, Your Opera uh, 3 and 4, uh, which premiered in London on June 17th of 1990. It was just uh, two years before his uh, death. Uh, he, he was just, uh, I think, 25 days shy of his 80th birthday. But all the, the material you're going to see today is entirely recycled. So arias that everyone is familiar with, uh, classics from European repertoire. Uh, Yuval Sharon, our artistic director, says, the only catch is that they're all performed at the same time. Now, through chance operations, uh, singers will perform arias that they select, while pianists play transcriptions of different operas and phonographs are playing different recordings. Uh, you'll even hear a 1920s Victrola, uh, which is the, all this is resulting in something that is quite exhilarating, bewildering, uh, and quite fantastic. As I said, I mentioned I saw it last night, the uh, final dress rehearsal, and was just blown out of my chair. So I can't wait for you guys uh, to see this. What is so wonderful, you know, often in opera, we're following the narrative, right? We're following the narrative of the story. Well, this has no narrative. And so as you're sitting and watching this, you just watch it with a complete open mind. Whatever you might be watching, you decide what that means. You don't have to wonder, well, I wonder what that, what does that mean? You decide what it is you're meaning as you're kind of taking in this cacophony of sound. Now, just a little bit about uh, uh, Cage. See, he was born in uh, 1912 in Los Angeles. He's a composer, of course, uh, a music theorist, a pioneer of electroacoustical and non-standard use of music. Uh, critics have lauded him as one of the most influential composers of the 20th century. Uh, he was also instrumental in the development of modern dance, uh, mostly through his association with choreographer Merce Cunningham, uh, who was Cage's romantic partner uh, for most of their adult lives. Now, Cage's teachers uh, included uh, Henry Cowell and Aaron Schoenberg, uh, both known for their radical innovations in music. Uh, but Cage's major influences uh, lay in a various, uh, various of Eastern and South Asian cultures uh, through his studies of Indian philosophy and Zen Buddhism. Now, this all happened in the late 1940s. Now, Cage came to the idea of aleatoric or chance-controlled music, uh, which he started composing in 1951 at the age of 39. Uh, the I Ching, an ancient Chinese decision-making tool, uh, becomes his standard composition tool for the rest of his life. Now, his most famous work, you probably know, this is how I first became aware of Cage, I think I was 18 or so, growing up in Chicago, was his piece of uh, 433, uh, which he composed uh, back, or, or arranged, I guess, uh, invented, he was also known as an inventor. Uh, Schoenberg often called him not a composer, but an inventor. Uh, this piece in 1952, uh, it's performed in the absence of of deliberate sound. So a group of musicians will sit down with their instruments and purposely not play. Uh, and so the audience uh, takes in all this environmental noise, all which is all around them. Uh, he believed that any auditory experience uh, could also be 
music. Now, Cage uh, was also a pioneer in the prepared piano, a piano with its sound altered by objects between or on the strings of the, or the hammers, uh, for which he wrote numerous dance works. Now, just a little bit about his uh, growing up. Uh, his father was uh, an inventor. Uh, his mother was a journalist there uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, and he starts playing the piano at, uh, in the fourth grade. Um, his musical talent wasn't particularly noted uh, at that particular time. And he goes on and he graduates uh, high school. He's the valedictorian of his class. And he goes off to study uh, college uh, at, uh, there in California. He goes off to study theology. Uh, and then he changes his mind, uh, and then he decides he's going to be a writer. And so about two years into college, he decides, forget all this. I don't need this schooling. If I'm going to be a writer, I need to experience life. So he drops out of college, and his parents uh, pay for him to tour through Europe. And it's during those uh, probably almost two years, a little more than two years, I believe it was, uh, that he begins to experience uh, like uh, you know, all kinds of music, uh, uh, Stravinsky and Hindemith and all kinds of, he even learns uh, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. He had not been familiar with his music. And it sort of changes his mind. He starts to, and begins to compose during this time. So uh, we have a special guest uh, who's going to talk to us a little more about John Cage. Um, he uh, is a Detroiter. He's a percussionist, a composer, uh, who's comfortable in all genres of avant-garde, experimental, contemporary, classical, and techno. Uh, he is the Detroit Bureau of Sound. Uh, Mr. Zach Brew, I believe, is here somewhere. Zach, are you here? There he is. Zach Brew, thank you for being here. Zach knows more about John Cage. We could talk forever. Uh, and unfortunately, we only have one mic, so we have to share this mic, Zach. <laughs> My first question I want to ask you, uh, and I know you've heard these questions because we've been, we've been doing our tour, haven't we, last month. Um, we were doing an opera uh, right before the pandemic began um, by Terrence Blanchard, Champion. Uh, and Champion was about a gay boxer who ends up killing uh, a man in the ring who had taunted him with gay uh, slurs. Uh, and so the opera pretty much uh, uh, sort of follows his life as he kind of struggles with this death. And 40 years later, uh, he finally uh, meets the son of the man he killed, and the son forgives him. And so that's probably the big, you know, big moment in the opera. And so Terrence Blanchard came to uh, Detroit to promote the opera, and so I was sort of his minder. I'd make sure he got picked up at the airport and had his dinner and make sure he had everything he needed. And so I had a lot of time to talk to him. So my first question was, you've got to tell me about this opera. At the moment when, the, uh, when Emile is forgiven by the son, you wrote no music, complete silence. Barry and Puccini would have been hammering away or sawing away on some great you know, lush orchestration, and he did no music. And I said, why was that? And he said, you know, the more and more I thought about it, it was such a, an amazing moment, I felt like silence was more powerful than anything. And so I know John Cage talks a lot about silence. Can you talk about silence in John Cage? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, thanks for having me, everyone. Yeah, um, John Cage on silence. Um, normal composers would use silence as a matter of context. Uh, you can surround it with a big moment. Uh, you can come away from it with something else exciting in music that you've written. But for John Cage, and as uh, Arthur mentioned, the piece 433, uh, he's using silence in the most non-deliberate, non-intentional way. Uh, piece 433 was premiered at Woodstock in uh, New York by the pianist David Tudor, and uh, he comes out on stage. For those who don't know, I'm sure a lot of you do. Uh, the piano lid opens and closes to delineate three sections of four and a half minutes of basically non-intentional sound, as you said. Um, so uh, Terrence Blanchard using silence and John Cage using silence, it is still silence, but um, what is contained or what is meant by that silence, I think is totally different. Terrence Blanchard is composing with it. John Cage is composing purposefully without it. You could think of it in those terms. So some background here, uh, Detroit Opera, I'm excited to be along for the ride here with the Year Opera's three and four production. Um, I'm Detroit's resident John Cage nerd, some may say. And uh, part of the uh, thing that I do here is you see there's an amplified cactus on stage. Um, he premiered a piece for the Amplified Cactus uh, 49 years ago today. Nice serendipitous moment. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, John Cage. Um, he, it's kind of mind-blowing. He premiered it right across the street at the Music Hall, and it's really such an honor to continue this tradition a little bit in my own way and um, in a way that I think some would say from an academic, from like a philosophical perspective. I, I'm still going for a lot of what John Cage was going for. Chance, chaos, um, removing taste from music. I find that when I'm performing the cactus, I'm as much of a listener to what's going on as you are. It's kind of just my hands that are exploring. But the really beautiful thing about the cactus um, in this kind of tradition, Detroit tradition that John gave us, it's one of the best instances in music that he's using sound in indeterminate ways 
that couldn't be possibly virtuosic. I'm exploring on this instrument. It's an instrument right now, at least, because I'm saying it is. He said it was. And um, I couldn't be better at it than you are. I can get just as lovely a sound, boink, on the cactus as you can. So it's, um, it's an inviting way to bring people into experimental music, I find. All of you showed up tonight, so you're probably hip to John Cage and the cool stuff already. But um, I'm always trying to challenge people to look deeper into what he was offering us. Uh, try and remove your taste as a listener, as he did remove taste from his own work as a composer. So yeah, um, back to your question about Detroit. I'm obviously able to talk forever about this stuff, but he, um, okay, so the timeline of my take on John Cage goes like this. He prophesized techno music, and that's just kind of a stance that I have, being into electronic music uh, from Detroit, known as techno. We kind of gave the world the best use of noise um, and there had already been people around the world before John Cage even who had been looking at uh, sounds of urban environments, sounds of cars and plumbing and you know refrigerators and radios coming about into people's homes. These are things that started to creep their ways into music and what these things are is noise, right? I find that Detroit was the place that was able to use noise best in the most, way, in the, in the most human way, I guess you could say, um, with techno music. So, um, the timeline. 1937, he pens this piece called The Future of Music Credo. And this is really um, an important piece for John Cage. It's early on in his career. He had quit school with Schoenberg. And, um, you know, now he's trying to venture out into the world and say his own thing with music. Sidebar, what he was trying to say was nothing in his own words. I have nothing to say and I am saying it. One of my favorite quotes of his. Good one. Um, so 1937, the future of music credo, the quote in this piece of writing that he gave us, if I can remember it verbatim here, it says, I believe the use of noise will continue and increase until we reach such a music that's produced through the aid of electrical instruments. So that's in 1937. And then in 1974, he writes another same title, future of music credo. After about 40, 35, 40 years of his career, and in this future of music credo, he's looking back and saying, oh, all the battles have been won. He was trying to liberate, you know, scales and harmonies and kind of what colonial Europe and that tradition had given America. And in Cage's search for dominance, um, not search for dominance, but you could say America's search for dominance, Cage is one of the preeminent voices that used chance and chaos and, and all that kind of stuff. So his influence spread around the world throughout those 40 years, and in 74, he looks back and says, all the battles are won. Noise is now music. Craft work had already happened. And it's that same year that he visited Cranbrook. Lila's here from Cranbrook. Shout out to Cranbrook for providing a nice exhibition downstairs. Snaps all around for that. Um, Cage visited Detroit, spent some time at Cranbrook, and I'm, I'm not making a direct link to like, you know, Derek May or Juan Atkins having seen Cage. I don't think they were there. But Cage's kind of macro influence on experimental over the globe, experimental music over the globe, culminated here in the city of Detroit, not five, maybe 10 years later, after he was right across the street playing this piece that I'm about to play for you right now. So, questions, anything else? Um, maybe I can say, hopefully I don't cause unnecessary sound here on the mic, okay. So, a little bit about the piece before I play it for you. Um, it's called Child of Tree. He uh, was touring, as uh, Arthur said, with the Merce Cunningham Dance Company, and they were in Santa Fe, Arizona, something like that, kind of sleeping in the desert with all the dancers and artists that were, they were touring with. Uh, before they were sleeping, a dancer comes up to Cage, being in the desert, finding a cactus, and plays it for him, kind of next to his ear. And that was just a couple months before he did it right across the street here, and it became this piece for Amplified Cactus. What he tells you to do, um, the piece is supposed to be eight minutes long, and I think I have time to do the full rendition. It's the, it's the anniversary after all, let's go for it. Um, so you divide the piece into three sections based on chance operations. You get random numbers from the I Ching, ancient Chinese numerology way of basically getting one out of 64 numbers. And the time structure that I'll play for you now is one that I came up when I first played this piece in college, maybe about like 12 or so years ago. I'm starting to feel old, but uh, um, cool. So hopefully uh, there's a sec before you venture into the other room to have this experience tonight. Um, we're not shy. Please come up on stage if you're curious about what this is like playing the cactus for yourself. You're very welcome to come. And um, email me any complaints.
So, so Mr. Zach Brew, this is uh, so this was Child of Tree, which premiered 49 years ago tonight, to the day across the street at Music Hall. Fantastic, fantastic. Now I noticed you did you pull your hair out to start <laughs> talks about that. I make sure I pull out one of the gray ones, um, but yeah, um, he says to make it three different sections, so that's one of the ways I'm showing you it's a new section. Actually, Mr. Yuval Sharon, who's our director of this production, do you want to say anything or do you have to get backstage? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Zach. This is fantastic. I think one of the things you had mentioned, we were talking um, at one of our stops about the idea of just letting go of sort of your preconceived notions about music, just let, just, just let yourself be open and experience, and I think if we could do that, especially what you're gonna to see today, you're gonna to be very amazed about what you're gonna experience. So, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that, or? Um, maybe, uh, if it's helpful. The biggest takeaway I had from last night, I mean, I'm into cages, I'm sure a lot of you are. The random moments that happen out of these, you know, arias just being put through a blender was so beautiful, and I'm sure there will be even new, different moments tonight. That's one of the most captivating things to me about what you'll see tonight, is kind of like the little vertical moments of beauty, weird harmonies, uh, weird noises that happen. Yeah, please enjoy. Beautiful, beautiful show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So you have 30 more minutes. If you want to come up and try out the cactus, make your way to the steps. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful show.